Right. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for sacrificing your lunch and come to the seminars for learning. And uh, we appreciate for your participation. So my name is Gary Wong, and I'm the director for the Center for Information Technology and Education, and I'll be facilitating these uh, seminars today. <clears throat> As you can see, we are thrilled to have Professor um, Bilko, uh, from, ed from Education Policy Organizations and Leadership at the uh, University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. And uh, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, we are very pleased to have him to visit us today and uh, to deliver this seminar uh, entitled Generative AI Implications and Applications for Education. And so let me introduce um, Professor Cole to you. Um, <clears throat> professor William Cole is a professor in the Department of Education Policies, Organizations, and Leadership. From the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. He's an Henry Lenses. Uh, recent research has focused on the development of digital writing and assessment technologies. With the support of a number of major grants from the US Department of Education, the Bills and Melinda Gates Foundations, and the National Science Foundations. He has co authored and uh, or co edited with uh, Mary Lenses, New Learning Elements of the Science of Education, um, Cambridge University Press in 2008. Uh, literacies, Cambridge University Press in 2012, and two volume grammars of uh, multimodal meaning, making sense, and adding sense um, in Cambridge University Press. So of course, the list can go on and on and on and, uh, without further ado. And uh, let's welcome the Professor Cook. Everyone, hear me okay? Working for the Zoom. All right. Well, look, thank you for inviting me here, um, uh, Gary. It's nice to see you again in person. I haven't seen you for a few years, not since COVID, so it's good to be here. And thank you, everyone, for being here and taking out your lunch time. So we've heard a lot of talk about this area of AI lately. And um, although I've worked in technology for a long time, uh, technology education, um, this is surprising. It came as kind of a shock. So although we kind of knew that something like this might happen, uh, it's happened incredibly fast. And we believe that the implications for education are really enormous. And if we are in education, we need to be thinking about them seriously because the, the world's going to be possibly a different place. So I'm saying that as somebody who's not never been a technology enthusiast particularly. I'm just saying that um, this has come upon us rather quickly and we need to be thinking about it. And that's what this talk's about. And the talk um, will be, I can give you a talk about my updates, my software updates, which will be a, quite, not a very interesting talk, but I won't do that one. Um, the talk um, will have three parts. Um, the first part is um, about the rise of generative AI in the context of what we call platform pedagogies, which is pedagogies that are around uh, computers and not just computers which are sitting by themselves separated from the world, but network computers. Um, and what does generative AI mean in the context of this long history of platform pedagogies? The second part is I'm going to show you what we're doing. And actually, um, I'm going to show you what we've done in the last week because we've been working um, since the end of 22, we've been working on applying generative AI in our classrooms. Um, and we've had a number of significant breakthroughs just in the last week or so. And I'm going to show you some of that work that we're doing in a, in a while. And it's work with actually students like you. So I work in university. And I teach teachers. Um, um, I don't actually teach people who are trained in teachers, I teach people who are already teachers. So I teach people who are in a master's program and a doctoral program. And I'll show you the work that they're doing as we're experimenting what learning will be like in these generative AI environments. And the last part is a kind of a philosophical part, which is implications of what is the, what, what's the future of learning, uh, where I want to actually question this idea of artificial intelligence. Um, in some ways, which we, we shouldn't take it for granted, is what I'm going to say. Um, well, I'll get to that in a moment. So let me start off um, with a little background. So firstly, people have been wanting to use uh, machines to video learning for a very long time. B.F. Skinner, the great um, behaviorist psychologist in the United States, took a patent for this in the 1950s. Um, which was a mechanical teaching machine. If you look down here uh, and you read the instructions at the bottom, um, what's going on is it's feels very much like the kind of instructions you might have for teachers and students in an e-learning environment. Now that's 70 something years ago. Then moving on fast forward, um, not that fast forward, 
Um, I work at the University of Illinois, and it was the University of Illinois that the first um, computer mediated learning system was built called Plato. Um, uh, and it was at the time considered to be revolutionary. In fact, it was revolutionary. Um, if you want to read a history of it down the bottom here, um, we've written a, a history of that particular piece of work. And what's interesting is in the period from 1950, so it begins in 1959, almost all the characteristics of modern e learning environments become obvious almost immediately in this unique environment. But the interesting thing is that it was an education innovation which really led technology. So that there is the first flat screen, the first plasma screen. And the reason why is computers in the back point, you fed in your cars and you've got calculations out the other end, they were just big calculating machines. And this was the first time that a computer was used to interact with and between humans in a human-like environment. It needed a visual screen and it needed a keyboard. It's the first time language was carried through a computer. And that was incidental to um, uh, the creation of this invention, if you like. The other interesting thing about this is that it kind of emulates cloud computing. So that's a terminal there, and there was a big terminal back somewhere else. There were multiple terminals all around the university, um, but they were all connected to a mainframe. So the basic architecture we have today is that old. So, you know, people think, oh, this stuff's new and the world's going to come to an end. No, um, it's not that new, although, as I'm going to say to you in a little while, the generative stuff is a, is a big leap. Now, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk um, a little bit about generative AI. And first, I'm going to start with um, a, a definition, which is it's uniquely reconstituted digital artifacts, text, image, sound, or in multimodal combination. Um, um, so what, and the sources of those things are being identified and patterned around supervised and unsupervised machine learning. I won't go into the detail of how that happens, but that's what underlies the technology. But the crucial thing with generative AI is it's got, a, got two components. One is a chatbot component, which is a dialogue. So you've got to say something. It's a dialogue between you and the machine. You say something, you put in a prompt, uh, and then something comes out. Um, um, but then what's in the back is what's called a large language model. I'm going to talk about what those things are and how they work, but there are two fundamental components. Now, again, these things are not new either. So the first chatbot was this chatbot called Eliza, um, 1966, Joseph Weizbaum at uh, MIT um, in the US. And um, it was a kind of a thing where he, he built this program language to um, build on uh, Carl Rogers' notion of, of psychoanalysis, which is you ask a person a question, and then you ask another question, you ask another question. So it's about building a dialogue where the analyst actually kind of almost steps back and is asking the uh, the other person to tell us what you what you need to know. So the, the idea of a computer as an interlocutor, as a dialogue machine, was invented back then. An interesting bit of the story, um, a couple of interesting bits of the story actually, was that um, he got his uh, secretary to try it out. You know, the, the days of men professors and women secretaries, and then it kept on asking these questions. The machine kept on asking, and it kept tailoring its answers. So the uh, tailoring the question, the next question to the previous answer, and so what she said, well, would you can't read the room? Because it was asking her a whole lot of private information which she didn't want to say. And that's the point where he became kind of slightly rattled by all this technology. And he wrote a very important book in the late 70s saying, look, this technology stuff could be really dangerous. We've got to be careful. So that's a bit about the beginning of the chat side. But there's another side of this, which is the large language model. And this here, um, is um, Robert Mercer. And this was a graphic I got from some magazine. I had a gift running um, behind him. So he was, a, again, another University of Illinois person. He um, uh, did his PhD in the early 70s, and he became um, one of the people behind a, uh, something which is called statistical language analysis, right, which is um, became natural language processing and, and, uh, and all the rest. A little bit of historical trivia, um, he became a very important person in this sense as well. Um, he became, um, first he made a fortune using these methods to play in the stock market and to play, um, so he, he set up a, uh, um, one of these derivatives and, and you know, stock market trading firms. He became incredibly rich, but then became the owner of Cambridge Analytica, which was the company which um, played through the uh, 2016 election. Uh, he was a Donald Trump supporter. Um, and what they would do is using all the 
Facebook profiles, um, they would put out 60,000 different Facebook ads a day. So if you were a Haitian living in a particular part of um, Miami, they emphasized the terrible things that the Clinton Foundation had done uh, in the Haitian earthquake. So it was using these language technologies in a very powerful kind of way. This is not new. So, um, so I, I want to sort of put that big context there first so you know that these are long historical processes going on. Now we have this in 2022. So in fact, um, the key breakthrough actually comes in 2017 when they work out a way to, look, firstly, the baseline is every published word's now been scanned. That's all accessible on the web. And um, uh, so, you know, Google's done Google book scans, scan every book in every library. You might be able to get to all of them, but it's all there. So, um, so the first thing is um, that's been there for a while. But the, what the, the breakthrough in 2017 was a Google breakthrough, actually, not, not an open AI breakthrough. They stole the idea, which is this idea of a transformer, which is we can, you know, every word in the world, times every word in the world is a number that's too big even for the fastest computer. But if we can find ways to rationalize that, which is the transformer logic, um, we can um, use stuff where we uh, we're, we're manipulate, manipulate not just words, but the relationship of words to each other. That's what it's about. Now, what I'm going to tell you is um, I've got a solution to the problem here. Because, you know, the problem is of chat GPT um, is you can, um, uh, where chat BT, you know, you put in a prompt, which is, I've been given an essay, which is the, the uh, causes of the French Revolution, and chat GPT will write me an uh, essay which is completely unique, and there's no way ever of detecting whether these texts have been written by humans or people. Um, you know, they try to sell you software that will do it, no software will do it. So one of the problems is that we've got a big problem in education when it comes to writing, when it comes to answering things, and, but this is a good solution. Is it a good solution? Um, no computers, no internet, uh, don't talk to anybody else, handwrite it all. Is that the future? You know, in a workplace, where you've got to work in teams, where you've got all these devices, where you're going to be using the machine to help you think. That's what these machines are for, they're to help us think. So if we do this in education, we're kind of putting our, uh, our kind of proverbial head in the sand. So um, what I want to do is just show you now some things that are kind of interesting and wrong about, about these, these uh, and the limitations, if you like, of general AI. So, um, these are some photos I took down the side here, uh, and uh, and here. So one of the things that I know and I'm unhealthy about it, amount about, which people shouldn't know anything about, particularly very obscure thing. Take an obscure thing like this. I know about the history of the Peloponnesian Railway, which is a, a little railway that ran all around the Peloponnese in Greece, and I follow it around. I see that bridge going across the current canal, and this is a ruin there, uh, and here's some abandoned steam trains. So I, I find this sort of thing interesting. So I know a lot about the Peloponnesian Railway. So what I did is I said to, to Chat GPT, and this was uh, version 3.5, I think, um, was I said, look, write me an essay with references, five paragraph essay about the history of the Peloponnesian Railway. And when it's going to get it wrong, I know it's going to get it wrong. So firstly, what it does, it writes a classic essay with connecting things like however and in conclusions, whatever. But also it gets things fundamentally wrong. It's quite definitive that it was decommissioned in the 1970s. No, it was closed in 2011. So that's a big mistake, right? Um, and then it's got references down the bottom, and they look pretty impressive, don't they? Uh, Dukas and Katsanakis in 2002, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they're rubbish. Invented them. Invented them. So one of the things is it has no way of understand, it reconstitutes the world in ways which sort of appear to make sense, but has no way of knowing what the world really is, and no way of ever knowing what its own source texts are. So it's got a pile of mushed up words about everything in the world, but it can't deconstruct or unpack, unpack what's in those words. Now, a very interesting phenomenon is that I did this days ago again. So there are now a number of these live language models around. I did it again with chat GPT, which is now in version four. And version four is smart enough to say, if you want to know more, go and look up various historical sources and read books or something. It's very, very vague. So it, it's, um, and the reason why it's vague is they have a process for um, filtering where they try to eliminate bad answers. And one of the, the only way you can eliminate this bad answer is to say, um, we're not quite sure, <laughs> go and look things up for yourself. 
very interesting thing is that Gemini, the new version of Gemini, which is the Google um, uh, um, GPT, was launched. Uh, the last last version is last week or so. And I asked it to do this same essay. And what it did, it put fictional references down the bottom, but then seconds later they disappeared because Google had a search that went and checked. It replaced the incorrectly uh, formed references uh, with correct links because its search went and found stuff that was real, but not because the LLM is capable of doing that. It's not, right? So the, the important thing here from an education point of view about the under, underlying technology, and I won't do this in any detail, there are a number of absolutely fundamental problems for education about the underlying technology. Now, I'm going to tell you a bit further along about how we can use it useful, usefully, but these are completely fundamental problems. If you want to actually read the longer playing version, we've written various articles in various places. I'll give you the, I'll give you the links at the end. There'll be some QR codes where you can get the, the references. So firstly, we've seen that it varies its sources. Um, it has no notion of empirical truth. The line closed in 2011, it's closed in the 1970s. Um, it doesn't have any theoretical frame. So what we're doing in math or in science or in subject, we're building conceptual frameworks about the world. All it has is what's called the bag of lilies. That's all it has. It doesn't have any theoretical conception of the world. Um, ethics. Now, the only reason why the, there's a lot of bad stuff out there in the world, right? Um, um, bad stuff in terms of, well, you know, violence, offensive language, that all has to be taken out manually, right? It, it's there and it will come up. It has to be taken out manually. And there's a, a particular technique called the jar break, which is if you're clever enough, you can work your way around what's called the manual filters. That's that's called the jar break. So one of the things is um, uh, if it's well mannered. So for example, if I said, look, um, a, a classic example is, um, I'm feeling really depressed. Give me the easiest way to suicide. It's not going to give you that answer, even, even though the answer is there. It could give you that answer, but it can't. It, people have taken out the capacity to give an answer to that question. Um, but somebody there is looking after our manners and who's that? Do we want companies doing that particularly? And what, what's the parameters whereby they look after our manners and look after what's good for us? That's all human intervention, not in the machine. Um, the last thing is it has a tendency to be positive, right? So um, uh, a very funny thing, one of what my researcher did last week when I lead kind of AI people, is he got uh, ChatGPT and he got Gemini and he said um, one of them was going to defend uh, nuclear energy and the other one was going to be a critic of nuclear energy. And he copied and pasted from there to there, what do you think of this, there to there, what do you think of this? Case? And they were incredibly polite to each other. People who are really passionate about these issues are not polite, right? Um, so it's got a kind of a whole thing in it where in order, it, it, it's it's tuned to be friendly, if you like. Now, that's not necessarily the best thing in education because you want the teacher to be critical. You know, like if I say to you all the time, well, that's fantastic. Keep on going. That's, keep, that's great. That's not really, we, we want critique as well. And you've actually got to override its tendencies to get critique. So these are a, a number of things where we've been developing a set of heuristics about what's wrong with it. Well, okay, what can we then do in education? Now, um, I'm going to get technical for a, a little moment. I'm not a computer science person. I've been working with this stuff a lot now. Um, I'm a kind of a, a language person. Um, and I want to kind of do a little definition of what this technology is. So it's essentially a text technology. And I want to define text for you. Um, text is that which can be expressed in Unicode. Right, so Unicode is the underlying structure system for everything on all your computers, everything else. The reason why my computer, which has uh, times 47 point, you know, bold or something, and your computer, which is a phone, can communicate is underneath that is a common set of understandings about a character set. And the Unicode character set, the latest um, release in 15.1, there are 149,830. 13 characters in that, that unit. So basically all it can operate with is that character set. And what it does, it pushes that down um, into binary notation. There's a binary notation for each of these things. That's how the computer processes it. Now, the very important thing, oh, I'll get to the multimodal point in, in, in the first point. Um, it works with semantic units. And um, my little comment is we're all Chinese now in the sense that it's not interested in D, O, and G because they're it's meaningless, right? It's interested in the word dog because it has a semantic reference, right? So in other words, and look, actually, that's how I read. I read the whole word dog. 
It might as well be a Chinese character. But nevertheless, the machine operates the same way. So it doesn't actually operate at the level, although it's operating with Unicode, it's operating with semantic units. And these semantic units are called tokens. Very important word that you need to know. Now, the important thing is that um, these, oh, by the way, the Unicode consists of both phonemes and graph graphemes, and it's basically, um, that's what Unicode deals with. Now, um, the interesting thing is, um, uh, it's multimodal, so it'll do image generation, but it'll only do image generation as a secondary relationship to text, right? So this is worth knowing. So you know, it's, I've got some crazy images that have been generated in a second, but but they're only generated because the source images have all been labeled. So there's a million images of dogs. <laughs> and there's a million images of standard poodles, as an example of a dog. And there's a million, you know, so many images of brown ones and so on. So what happens is, because those images are labelled, the machine only knows what's in that image because it's been labelled and it finds other similar images and matches the label. So that's in terms of the, the, the corpus of images down the back. And it only gets those images out for you when you actually give it a lang linguistic prompt, right? So everything that happens, yes, it's profoundly multimodal and they launched a, a GPT version called, or what was it, you know, last week? Um, which does video, it only does it because language text is the media, not language text, text in the sense of that which can be represented in Unicode. Um, the important thing, though, is that it flattens levels of playing field between map, computer code, and written text. They're all on the same playing field. So what it can do with mathematical notation, what it can do with speech, what it can do with um, computer code operates on exactly the same principle, which is the, the statistical relationship of Unicode characters to each other. Got it. Sorry, that was quick. You get the basic idea. I just wanted to give you a little kind of explanation as to how the darn thing works. Now, um, what it works with is latent semantic. So it actually knows nothing about the world. It doesn't. So I've got a little sentence here. Uh, I walk to work and I generated these images with Leonardo, which is one of the image generators. So I put I walk to work in. I actually put a bit more than that because I wanted to um, get something more specific. But it was really I walk, walk to work. Now, the token here that I'm working on is walked, right? So this is actually two tokens. Walk is there. ED um, indicates something about the past tense, but the token would be walk, okay? Um, so in other words, there's a rough correspondence between tokens and words, but not totally so. Now, what I want to show you now is this is a different kind of walk, right? Because it involves a different kind of agency. I walk to work. It's very direction-oriented. Um, uh, work is where I'm going, so it's kind of a set of, um, but here I'm walking the dog, the dog's actually walking me, um, you know, because, and this is another Leonardo image, um, and I have a dog that, that supposed to look like that, but it doesn't look like that actually, but nevertheless, that's, I said, to do a picture like my dog, and he takes me for walks, you know, I, I go for a walk with him every day as he needs to walk, he makes me walk, so in other words, walk actually has an interesting kind of difference there. Uh, in meaning, right? It, it might look like the same word, it's not the same word, because the relationship of me to the world, my agency, my relationship to the things in the world around me um, are very different. Then here's another thing is that I'm the guard there in blue and I'm walking the prisoners to their cells. That's a different kind of walk. Now, the very interesting thing it does is if I did normal grammatical analysis, that's, you know, first person pronoun, this is the verb, past tense, um, the prisoners to their cells, which is the, that's the subject, that's the object. It doesn't, uh, normal grammatical analysis doesn't pick out these supplements. Um, and in fact, what we can do is we can become very technical about uh, grammatical analysis. Um, and in fact, if I want to get really technical about the difference between those three walks, and I did heavy duty linguistics, it's about voice transitivity case, um, which are complicated, which, which no one's ever going to think about. But the point is, Case transitivity and voice are all there in everything we do. Um, and what this is doing is without, uh, and by the way, Mary and I wrote these two books, which Gary mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, where we try to think about these underlying structures of meaning in the world. Um, now, what's interesting is that by putting that word walked in relation to other work, walks in other uh, contexts, uh, it actually is picking up a whole pile of subtle semantic differences but it's only like, it's not because it knows, it has any means at all. It's only about 
the differences in the way walk can be positioned in a sense, right? So that makes it actually kind of very powerful as well. So it's this completely senseless, meaningless technology, which in this lately kind of way can pick up these subtle meanings, which even our, our regular grammar that we teach in schools can't. You need a very high level academic grammar to tell the difference. Um, so um, now we've written, and this is a, I'll have a few of these QR codes here. We've written a rather, a not terribly easy paper about this. Um, um, we're honestly, we wrote the paper just trying to think through what these issues were. If you want to get the paper, the QR code will take you there. Um, and I can leave this with you later if you want to um, follow it through. So, um, now that then is a kind of a little, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh -oh. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I was pushing the thing to that board. That's the first part. Any questions? Horrifying, too difficult. You kind of get the so you have to get the rough idea. Rough That's why I'm kind of um saying this. Okay, now I'm going to show you what we're doing with our students. And our students, as I say, are um are teachers. Who are doing masters and doctoral degrees? So the first thing is, and to be very close to is we're using this platform called Scholar, which does a whole lot of stuff, which I won't talk about. Um, um, is that um, it's very collaborative. It's kind of like social media. It's multimodal. They can put in um, all sorts of media, like videos and stuff, in their work. It's driven by analytics. Um, um, these are the things it does. Plus, this is the new thing that we put in about a year ago. And the latest version of this, which we put in about a week ago, I'm going to show you now. So I just want to give you that as a kind of a, a quick context. One of the things we do, by the way, is we comb through everything the students are doing. So they're doing it in a web-based environment. And one of the things that it's poss not possible to do in a regular classroom is we have analytics, which is measuring everything students are doing across those 22 different metrics. This um, here is the expectations, which in the admin settings we've set on all these measures. So we set all this up, it's quite easy, it takes 15 minutes to do. The width of this pedal here is um, uh, the weighting we put on it. We've got three macro categories, which is knowledge, things you can demonstrate you've learned, focus, which is the amount of effort you put in, and help, which is a collaboration metric. And as you do your work, you start off with this as zero, and as you do your work, this gradually grows out, and our expectation as teachers in, in the course is 100 there. That's where you're going. So it actually allows students to see all the time exactly where they're up to because it's data mining all their work as they go. So that's just a little context about the analytics. Now, what I'm going to do now is tell you what the students do in our uh, in our courses is they do um, a, a peer reviewed project. I'm going to tell you the steps they go through, but I'm going to focus soon on the AR review. So what they do is they start a project. And the project might be 3,000 words, 5,000 words. So it's a major project on a topic. It might be differentiated instruction. It might be diversity in the classroom. It might be implementing new technologies in the classroom. So it's a major project. They do a draft. And then after they do the draft, they do an AI review. So we get, um, in this case, it's ChatGPT we've been using, but in fact, we can use any large language model to do it. Um, we do an AI review, right? Now, after that, which I won't talk about so much today, is they revise and submit, and then it goes to peer review. They get feedback on their peer reviews from, they give feedback to their peer reviewers. And then after that, after the human feedback, they revise and submit, and then they, then they compare the human and the, the um, AI review, and then it gets published to the class knowledge bank the portfolio. So that's kind of the workflow. Um, but what we're doing, which is kind of deliberate in a way, is we've got the AI doing reviews, but we always have humans in there in the same space doing the same reviews as a kind of a reality check. Is the AI right? You know, did, did, what, what was the quality of the AI feedback compared to the human feedback? So one of the important things is never use AI in these environments without humans checking that AI all the time. So that's there. Now, what we want to do as well, and I'll put this here in a way which is kind of deliberately unreadable because don't worry about this. We This is what we're analysing the, the, the work with. So we've got empirical questions, conceptual questions, 
reasoning questions, application questions. So we've actually got these eight measures here that we're that we're measuring the work with. And this is a very long form description of all these things um, uh, of, the, of what, what's been. And this is the rubric, if you like, that we have when students do their work. Now, this is the AI review. And what I'm going to do is I am going to, at this point, change over from PowerPoint and show you the actual work and the actual feedback. So firstly, um, the AI, this is the student work on the left, right? This is the project they did. This was the advantage of the um, peer feedback here on the left. And then against those different color-coded rubric items, a whole pile of feedback comes back, right? It gives them feedback on their work that helps them go to revision before the peer review happens. So let me just see here. Oh, and by the way, this is the learning model before I show you the actual live version of the work. Um, so what you, we've got on the left is what we call a multimodal text editor, which is they're doing these extended multimodal texts. They're thinking about the particular domain. Uh, it's, they're working by themselves. And then on the right side, we've got formative assessment, metacognition, thinking about thinking and collaborative learning. So it's a kind of a, a dialogue between the two sides of the screen. So that's that side, left, right. And this is theoretically what's going on here, left, right. Okay, so that's kind of your learning theory about what's happening in the architecture of that screen. So let me go here now, and I am going to take you to an actual piece of work to show you what it looks like. Um, so let me go over here. Sorry, I've got all this stuff in the way. So this is a web environment now. Right, so firstly, um, they've got this text editor on the left where they can put in images and text. But on the right here, what they've got is... Ah, uh, right. sorry, thank you for picking that up. So what we have um, on the left is the work they're doing with a multimodal editor where they can put in videos and all sorts of media and they can write around it. But on the right, we have this rubric here. And one thing to see about the rubric is that look at this have you ever seen a rubric that long this is item number two look at this it goes forever what a painful rubric right see that now there's a reason for that in that one of the things um, in um this generally like ice space one of the things to do is is to be overly explicit about things to say it one way and say it another way and say it different and to, so to get the best results and, th and this is called this technique is called prompt engineering. So you actually, it's a chatbot, you're the chat side, but when you when you chat like this with a huge amount of explicit information, um, it's um, going to give you better results, right? So with a given being, you wouldn't because you'd bore them silly and whatever. But what we do is we uh, give that to the all the students so they're seeing exactly what the computers see when it comes to the rubric, right? Um, so now let me just show you now. Um, this then is what the student produced. So you can see here is the John Dewey piece. They put in infographics. They put videos in lines, which you can run like this, right? So, um, and this is a piece that somebody did art design in Chicago about murals, community mural building. So you can see here, this is a multimodal piece of work. There's a bit of Richard Bordy speaking about John Dewey. Uh, there's the, the kids building their, their mural, which was part of the project. Um, uh, so you can see this is a very, very substantial piece of work. And I go to the end, there's more murals that the kids did. Uh, I go to the very, very end, and you can see here they've got a whole pile of traditional academic references. So I want to know what that, that's the what they that's the work they were doing, and it was a major project part of a, a whole course. Now I'm going to show you the feedback. So look, okay, I'm the teacher, and I get this to assess. You're the teacher. Tell me, you read it through, how much are you going to write? And how are you going to grade it? That piece of work. They just think, you know, it's a fair bit of one might take you a quarter of an hour, half an hour to read it. And when you've done that, how much are you going to write? Maybe a paragraph or something, you know. A really diligent teacher might write a paragraph. Do you want to see what the GPT wrote? Um, and I'm going to show you the feedback on this particular work from this is from last week, I might say. So I've got to go and I've got to reshare because I'm sharing a different object here. So you might have to help me. Uh, can you bring that one up? Oh, 
Ah, oh, that's fine. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to try. This is the feedback the GPT gave. So see here. Remember the colored, the colored graph, the circle. Experience, right? Um, connection with personal experience. And by the way, remember before I said it tends to be too friendly. So we actually say we want negative comments as well, which is experience plus experience minus. So these are the positive comments. And these are the negative ones. We demand negative comments in the sense that we want we want feedback, which is critical for the student to be able to improve. Now, let's look at this, and I want to show you how much feedback there was. Um, and by the way, this is just a data dump so you can see it. Um, it came in those colored stickies that you saw in the screenshot, but, but this is the, the data dump. Okay, suggestions for improvement, relevance, importance, rating four. So on the first one, rating a four. Experience criteria 1B, response. Concepts, the concepts you use. You know, um, uh, suggestions for improvement. Theory, how well the theory was used around visual design in the case of mural construction. Clarity, links, and distinctions. <clears throat> what do you reckon? Is that enough feedback? Now, the problem is that I keep on going. Suggestions for further innovation. So, Criterion by criterion, it gives you detailed suggestions about what to do. Now, no teacher can do that. Now, one of our problems was perhaps this is overwhelming, perhaps this is too much, right? And one of the nice things is you can dial it down. So one of the things we're planning to do is have a little button where you can dial down the amount of feedback. You know, I want more feedback, I want more, more less. But one of the things is that this is now an environment where it, it's just no teacher could do it. Yes. Um, so as far as the the AI prompting, do you give it like a selection of um, like course reading or like course books that you have like the information that they're... You're you you're ahead of the game. That's exactly what we do. I'm going to show you. I'm going to explain how we do with technology which have only existed since the day before yesterday. Uh, I'm going to go to the end first because you need to see it all. Okay, so let me go back now. Can I go back to the PowerPoint? Uh, and we might need to swap back to the Zoom people, but I'll let you do that. Okay, so we were there before. So that was the, the work that we saw with the feedback. This was the feedback we saw. Right, this is how we do it. Um, um, so firstly, this is stuff we've done already, and your answer is number two, but I'll start with number one. We built this as a piece of software which is agnostic to different LLMs, so we want to be able to swap between um, as as they develop. And one of the interesting phenomena, I think, at the moment, firstly, OpenAI dominated. The Gemini uh, uh, LLM looks pretty darn good, to be quite frank. But also, what's emerging are small, lightweight ones, a lot of which will be open source. So we want an environment where we can plug into different LLMs, which is what they call the foundation model, which is a huge text model that's underneath. But the second thing we built is a, um, a what's called the vector knowledge base, which is um, using a technology called retrieval augmented generation. Now, let me tell you what that is simply. We um, took everything that our students in our classes have done for the last five years and everything that Mary and I have written over, over how many years, and we put it into a, what's called the vector database. So, in fact, that was 35 million words. So we put 35 million words student work and our work into this vector database. And what it does, it matches all those words up. It just builds, you know the word warp? Every time it finds warp, it connects warp to 12 different things because there are 100 different types of warp in the world, yes? And what it does in the database, it's just a database which is a big pile of words. So we put 35 million tokens of this, not words, but roughly words, 35 million tokens into this vector database. So it meant that it was an expert around our domain, and our domain is education, innovation, technology, pedagogy, all that kind of stuff. So we now have this incredible knowledge base, which is all this stuff. You know, our students are, you know, they're, they're teachers, they're doing master's degrees or doctorates, they're smart people. There's a pile of knowledge there, which is incredibly valuable, stuff that they've experienced with their learners, in their classes, in their readings, in their research. So we use that knowledge base, and that's why the feedback is so well tailored. Uh, to the, the students that are there. The other thing is um, prompt engineering. What we do is, you know, I do one prompt in chat GPT, I've got one answer. We take each of the, in fact, it's 10 rubric 
ohms, which are all got that long, long turbo specification. And we go through the work 10 times, right? So it actually runs the thing, and that's called prompt engineering. So we have multiple passes over the work. And now, fortunately, we can put the whole work in. We couldn't do that before, but now they have um, a bigger, what they call context windows, so you can put in much bigger works. So the full work, that whole piece of work about mural, um, switching murals in school, um, the whole thing went in. And we ran it against those 10 rather than those prompts. So that's big. Um, what we're working on at the moment, on the right here, this is just work in progress, is what's called multi-agent programming. So we can have to say, all right, I want to understand this from the teacher's perspective. I want to understand this from the learner perspective. So we can, you can build in multiple perspectives and multiple, many agents, if you like, that are part of the prompting process. It can be multimodal, so we're, we're not far off being able to, remember there was a video in there, include the, the video in the analysis as well. Um, dialogical, at the moment, you just get feedback. We want to be able to say, what do you mean by that? And give, explain it a bit more. So we can build dialogue in there. So every item of feedback, the student can go back and ask the question of the AI. Um, and I mentioned this before, we want to be able to dial the feedback up and down because perhaps that they were welcome that much feedback. You know, perhaps I'm going to need one page of feedback. That's all I can deal with today, but, <laughs> rather than 10. So, so they're things that we're working on at the moment. Um, so, ah, there we go. Oh, okay. So these are, if you like, our kind of conclusions here. Um, this is how, you know, I started by saying there are incredible deficiencies and problems in the underlying technology, and this is how we, uh, we deal with this via prompt engineering and retrieval or meta generation, uh, gen, um, uh, generation. And down here, there's an article that we published in archive. Unfortunately, we've done a lot more work since then. So we've got a lot of publishing to do to write this down stuff up. Uh, but that article there in archive gives a kind of an empirical description of one of our, our earlier interventions a year ago. Now, uh, here we go. Now, is that too much? You don't want to do part three, do you? <laughs> You're right. You're looking worn out or stunned or whatever. So this is a um how do we have the time by the way? So we quite Oh, I agree. Okay, I'll do this in ten minutes, I promise. Yeah. And then we'll have time to talk. So I want to get philosophical now and talk about what does this mean for the future of learning. Um so um the people who are overly enthusiastic about this stuff say this is going to be artificial general intelligence. Now, what do we mean by general intelligence? I don't know whether you people know do intelligence testing or, or no intelligence tests. They're still pretty relevant for in areas, especially education, less relevant in other areas. But there was this old notion called G, general intelligence. When you're doing an intelligence test, you're trying to hit G. Well, can these machines ever do G? And our answer is no, they can't, because all they uh, do is sensing on manipulations of words. That's all they do, and they don't actually know what they're doing beyond that. But there's a lot of value and power in words, as we saw with that word wall. Yes. Um, so, um, but what I want to do is I want, I want to question um, the the notion of artificial intelligence at all, right? And I want to propose something slightly different to describe what's happening here. So this is one of the most famous men in computer science. Um, more importantly, he was uh, Liz, you know, he was a, a, a foundation, a very, very, very important programmer. Uh, but he coined the phrase um, artificial intelligence, it's John McCarthy in 1950. Um, and it was just a trendy thing. He just thought of a clever thing to put in a funding application. You know, that that's what they were going to do. And they had this seminar in 1956, and that's him later in his career playing chess with a computer. So, um, but what, and, and what the, and it's covered up a little bit, which is, um, you know, making a machine to behave in a way that human would, oh, there we go, making a machine behave in ways that would be called intelligence if a human was so behaving. So it's building a direct analogy between human intelligence and machine intelligence. And what I'm going to argue is the two are fundamentally different. Machines are much, much smarter than human beings in some respects, um, and nothing like human beings in others. Right, so what I want to talk about is um, this word cyber. Can we pull that up again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't want to use the word cyber rather than artificial. So this is the origin of the word cyber. It was an uh, MIT science by the name of Norbert Weiner, who in the 1940s 
created this notion of cybernetics. And he took it from this is a Greek, um, an ancient Greek pot. And this person at the end is uh, the Kibernetes, which is the oars person. If you want to know what the, the etymology of um, uh, cyber is, it's that. So this is the story of Odysseus who's been tempted by the sirens, but the most important thing is there's something at the back of this that keeps adjusting. So cyber means these kind of adjustments. It's a relationship between the machine and the human where the human keeps adjusting stuff. That's where the word um, cyber comes from. Um, but what I want to talk about is I want to talk about technology and society in general terms. And this little thing up here on the steam engine was uh, the first, if you like, um, uh, machine which was able to do something cognitively the human does. So this is a, a steam engine from 1784, which was a Bolton and Watt engine, um, which was used to pump water out of the mines in England. So this man, um, uh, uh, James Watt, invented this steam engine pumping water out of the mines. Now this little thing is called the governor. And what the governor does, nice work governor, by the way. So when it's like this, it's a set of weights going in and out like this, right? So when it goes out, it reduces the amount of steam going in. When it goes back, it lets more steam go in. So actually, it's what it's what the put yoursman would have done. Keep adjusting, keep adjusting. So he's the first machine to do cognitive work. He's thinking, okay, we need more steam. Oh, we've got too much, we need less. So the the the, the, the spinning, this spins around like this, right? The spinning weights were the machine was running itself. It was doing something which a human would have otherwise done, which the machine was so in a way, look, this is um the idea about the relationship between humans and machines and having things um, which were um, self-governing. So this, um, the people later on, the cybernetics people call these the non-trivial machine with servo mechanisms, self-regulating mechanisms where the machine regulates itself. That's a big shift in terms of the history of technology and it's not a new one, as you can see. So what we're arguing is instead of artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, we're arguing for kind of cyber social intelligence this machine is incredibly smart. It's, look, it's got every word ever published, written down inside the damn thing, and if you calculate the relationship between those words, no human can ever do that, right? But it does it in a way where it doesn't understand the meaning of those words. So um, what we're talking about is this uh, notion of cyber-social learning is not artificial intelligence, which is a machine that replicates the human, but two things which are very, very different which relate to each other in a complementary way. The machine is really, really helpful, but it's not anything like me. So that's kind of a, a philosophical point that we're making. We're trying to, if you like, you know, we use the word AI all the time, but we're trying to critique of that very notion. So um, how are human machine intelligence different? Firstly, the brain is not just binary. These machines only, remember I said underneath human code is binary notation, underneath an image is pixels, which are, represented in binary notation. Um, the brain is not just fine. It's much more complicated. And, but also bodies are more than brains. Look, I can feel things, I can sense things, I have emotions. Um, but also context are more than bodies. So the meaning of what I'm doing in this room is about the way in which the space is configured as well. So machines can't do any of that. They can just, uh, you know, well, generally AI stuff can just manipulate Unicode, essentially. So, um, that's the end of the argument. If you, if you that QR code there, and look, this is Scholar, which is where we do all this work. It's groaning under too many users. So if you if you want to follow that Q, um, QR code there, it's going to be a bit slow because <laughs> we have too many users at the moment on a system which is groaning for no use. But this is where you'll find a lot of stuff that we've written about this. So that's my story. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cook, for your uh, wonderful sharing, very insightful, and I think it's really time for us to publish the floor for discussions and questions. So, all right. Thank you so much. Very thoughtful. Okay. Very interesting the uh, notion of cyber social learning. And then, questions in my mind include number one how does that cyber social learning relate to platform pedagogy? So, you're introducing the very company. Right. And also, how does that platform pedagogy relate to the classical multi-literacies 
learning framework and also your and Mary's uh, design learning framework and, and what will be the future for uh, multi literacy needs or multi model literacy needs uh, in Chile at the age. Thank you so much. Oh, I didn't have the right rest. <laughs> um, so, firstly, you know, the cyber social idea is that we're learning in and with and through machines now. That's just the reality of it. And look, I've got my phone in my pocket, and we're we connected to these things. And so part of it, all learning has to be uh, aiming that relationship, making the most of that relationship, but also realistically knowing the differences. It's making up things I can't do, it's helping with things that I can do, and so on. So that's the, 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 the platform idea, the fact that we're connected into this web of machines now, and how do we make that the most productive relationship for all of us. Um, in terms of the multiple interesting argument, what's very interesting is, um, Firstly, you need a kind of grammatical analysis to understand what's going on in these things, and a lot of what we've done is, 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 is to, to, to do that. So when I was dealing with the, the sentence about walking, that's actually a grammatical analysis of what's the meaning? How do these meanings hang together? How do they work? And we've been interested in that in the multi interest work all along. The other interesting phenomenon is um, the multimodal part, the fact that I created those images of the, <laughs> the walking, the walking images um, just in seconds using an AI, which is we're going to be building these multimodal knowledge representations very, very easily. And we need to be doing that with children in classrooms. We need to get them used to moving between these different forms of meaning and, and, um, uh, and so on. So the multi-literacy stuff kind of becomes more relevant than, than ever. So that's a kind of a, a very short answer. That was something that we probably need to do a lot, lot longer than so answer. Thank you for very informative presentation, and I'm very inspired. So uh, I'm really interested in using AI to facilitate teachers' feedback. Because in the real-time teaching, uh, formative assessment and feedback are compromised by time constraints or okay. energy constraints. So uh, in your project, you use AI feedback and human feedback, but at different stages. So I'm really wondering why is that? Can we use that AI feedback and human feedback at the same time? Uh, not use human feedback to check accuracy, but to use AI to facilitate the positive feedback. Thank you very much. You, you, look, you can do that in any order. We're doing it. We actually did it the other way around at first. We did human feedback, then AI feedback. Um, what we found though, by doing the AI feedback first, it sets it raises the bar for the human feedback. <laughs> you know, it sets a model of, of how to give good feedback. So there's no necessary order in which to do that, but you're absolutely right. Um, uh, Bloom, of Bloom Taxonomy, Benjamin Bloom, um, had this notion in um, 80s, 70s, um, called the two sigma, sigma problem, you know this reference, which is basically, is it possible to shift learning by two standard deviations if, um, if you, uh, well, the model is it is possibly in one-to-one -one situations. So the ideal learning situation for Bloom was one-to-one, uh, -one, which is one teacher, one student, right? That's the most effective learning situation. Um, and was it possible to replicate that in, in a, 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 a mainstream classroom? So he thought up this whole idea of mastery learning, which before technology was very, very hard to do. Now it's possible to do, that's the whole point. Um, and the teacher needs to be the administrator of that process or the manager of that process, the administrator of that process. Um, uh, and then everyone's on one-to-one. -one. But let me tell you something else. It's more than one-to-one -one because no human could give feedback that finely calibrated and that detailed. So it's not just in the detail. It'd also be very finely calibrated. You can pick up on stuff which a human doesn't pick up on. Um, my, my very simple example of that, actually, there's a very, that, that I like giving, is... Um, if anybody's involved in instrumental music, there's a set of um, software called Smart Music. They just changed its name now um, to something else. And what it does is you're playing your violin. And what it does, um, if you've got the note right, it's green, if it's slightly wrong, it's orange. So it's an electronic score, right? Um, and you keep playing um, uh, and you see, oh, I've got that note wrong, oh, that was right, and whatever. So the, the notes change to red or green as you go through along the score. No music teacher could ever do that because they'd be interrupting the student all the time, right? But the student can, in an instant, see that that note was wrong, but without interrupting the flow of the music. So one of the interesting, that's a very good example of formative feedback, by the way. Now, with these technologies of generative AI, 
it just changes the game. So the one scenario is, uh, do we need human teachers anymore? I'm not going to say that, but you know, look, people are going to say that. I mean, how many people are going to be out of work with these new technologies? They're going to say, well, computers can do this better. What's the role of a human teacher? Well, of course, there is a very important one still, and we've got to define that role. Otherwise, people are going to say, okay, I'll, just, I'll do the course at home and I'll get better feedback from the machine. And <laughs> why, would I, why would I have a teacher? So we, we have, it changes the teaching profession as well. But you're absolutely right. The most powerful thing is formative assessment, which we've never been able to do well. And we've never done well. So, so, uh, so, so thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation. Uh, my, my name is Carol, and I'm a second year PhD student in the of Education. So my problem, uh, my, my question is, uh, because like uh, we have interviewed some students about the AI feedback, and one of the problems we found is that uh, some of the students, they don't trust AI. And uh, like, even, even if teacher feedback is much, short, uh, much shorter than AI-generated feedback, but they value such short uh, feedback more than AI feedback because they think like that's from the teachers. So if the students like uh, if they don't agree with uh, by with the, the, the AI feedback, they will not make any changes with uh, like according to the feedback. Okay. So what from your perspective, what do you think like how can we deal with such problem? Okay. If in the future we will apply uh, the, like AI feedback in lots of educational uh, settings, that will be the question. So if they don't trust AI feedback, they're absolutely correct not to trust because we know it can't get facts right. So one of the important things is never ask an un, uh, unfiltered AI uh, when the Peloponnesian Railway closed because it'll get it wrong, it'll make something up. So one of the things is don't trust it, and the word that's used is hallucination, um, which is a kind of funny anthropomorphic word to use because in fact it's just wrong. It's not hallucination, there's nothing human-like about it, it's just wrong. So they're right not to trust it. Um, so what, we, what we're trying to do with this, our experiments here and our interventions is think how can we use it in ways which are most effective. So one is it can give higher level uh, critical analysis of the way in which you presented your knowledge. Don't ask it about the facts because we can't rely on the facts, right? right? But ask it about here, was this framed in a way which is critical? Are there other things that could have been said? Are there other perspectives? But it's kind of high level. So that's the prompt engineering side. The other side of it is the kind of the, this knowledge based side, which is let's say um, you're teaching cell biology in the high school. Well, you know, if you put in six cell biology textbooks into the knowledge base and that gets prioritized, it's going to give pretty good answers, to be quite frank. So there are ways in which, you know, the underlying, uh, the underlying technology has these deep problems, but it's about uh, refining and recalibrating the way in which we relate to that um, via this, these knowledge bases and prompt engineering. So they're the kind of key techniques to get around that. And in a way, by the time that feedback comes through now, there's nothing, the feedback's good actually. There's nothing, we haven't asked it to be factual in the first place. Uh, the second thing is we've got this knowledge base, which is deeply knowledgeable on the basis of 35 million words that all our grad students have written for five years. So, yeah, so the, yes, stay suspicious, but then we as educators have to find these ways to use it in the best possible ways. Yes, very much. Uh, I'm a uh, new teacher in the interdisciplinary program that educate you. Um, uh, in my last tutorial, I introduced uh, ChatGPT feedback and also kind of support for my students because uh, the data science group project is, I think, yeah, I think it's a project. And uh, I emphasize one thing about Gen AI for them is that it's because many of them are first or second years and uh, they're, they're, they're constructing the theory of knowledge and I introduced to them how Gen AI is really good at classifying teaching all the things so they get the right terms to seek out more resources on their own like platform to Google, Wikipedia or popular databases, something like that. So I demonstrated how I myself, uh, I did not demonstrate how to make a data project myself, but instead I show creative writing. So I put in some notes I wrote and then uh, I asked Gen AI to um, uh, analyze the literary devices and then to actually see children that see uh, it looks irony and dialogue and this and that. These are things that uh, I would not have thought of when I did right. this, and, and uh, this would be useful for them to monitor the product. 
virus also out. Yeah, that's a good example. But, you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, I, I say this kind of a, in the wild version of chat GPD, which is just go to the interface and do something. But we're trying to build a kind of layer above that, which um, makes it more useful, which refines it and makes it more useful. But certainly it's useful. Any questions on this side? Yes, if I need. Thank you for this uh, talk. Uh, I'm a mathematics educator. I wonder if there's any any protocol in the content thing. About the implication of this genetic life for mathematics teaching and learning? Yes, yeah, no. Um, you, may, uh, you may have heard this, but the Khan Academy people who have got a lot of math material have built a, um, a chatbot called Khan Vigo, um, which is um, with math. But one of the very interesting things about math is the way in which this treats math. So it treats math as just simply as text. And the interesting thing for me about math is it's kind of, in a way, a return to the old new math, which is if you've got, it can be most helpful when you have students which are explaining what they're doing along the way. They're mixing the math with text. Um, uh, and also it can be very helpful in problem situations as well. So the, the whole idea that math is not a sort of just simple abstractions on a page, but it's related to the real world and that it has reasoning behind it, which may not necessarily be the same all students, right? Um, so, um, uh, you know, classic cases where explain this to me, or you you explain what you think you're doing, right, in this particular math or method. So, if you've got math embedded in narrative text like this, it's probably going to be most helpful. So, I think it has enormous implications for math and computer coding uh, because it treats them all the same. It treats, you know, for me, math and computer coding are just forms of text. And, and that's the way this operates as well. So I think it's going to have huge implications. And you know, in terms of the, the paradigm wars in math, it's, it's kind of an interesting return to the old new math, which is problem based and logical and explanatory. I'm not a math person, but I just I feel as if there's huge implications there. Further questions? I know you have a lot of questions in your mind, and uh, don't hesitate to just throw it out for uh, further discussion. Yes. Great. Um, I'm not really sure how to word this question. Uh, so, so in your when you're Putting in all the, the data for the AI model when you put in all, all these uh, the research papers. Is there a concern that because you are filtering out, you know, a lot of information in the world that you would limit the kind of creativity within the answers to the questions? So like I mean, by being specific to your field, maybe you're eliminating connections that might exist with other fields. Um the foundation model is always there. So the foundation model is the, the copy of everything on the web, right? So in our class, if somebody asked about the history of the Peloponnesian Railway, they'd get it, even though we didn't put it in. Yeah. So in other words, what it does, what the, the knowledge base does, it uh, it prioritises a certain number of texts. Uh, and the interesting thing is that it will reference those texts correctly as well. So it's like hierarchy. Yeah, like yep, yep, yep. But when it can't find stuff in the knowledge base, it'll go down into the foundation model um, um, but you know, presumably, we're not asking questions outside the, yeah. the domain of the course, so yeah. So, I guess, uh, I can forward the last questions for you to wrap up and uh, have a good conclusions on that. And uh, so, um, overall, I think this is very interesting because you know, it challenges a lot of. Uh, the things that we are, you know, dealing with the human intelligence and how AI might be able to assist us in uh, developing our human intelligence. 
So one of the tech keys in AI is that we know is what we call explainable AI. Right. And, and so now we're dealing with the black box. And sometimes so this black box is working in a way that the human can really understand our brain. So how could we as educators to take the advantage of AI and try to put forward the explainable AI concept to help the students and teachers to learn further and develop their intelligence? But that might be my kind of question. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So look, one layer of the answer is AI literacy. You've got to know how these things work to know the limitations. So that's really important. Uh, the other layer is how to come up with a particular answer. No one knows. No one's ever going to know because it's lost in these neural nets. Um, so which is layers and layers and layers of calculation um, backwards and forwards. So it's invariably a black box. Um, I don't really know how my refrigerator works, but I get on all right with it. You know, so um, it's a matter of how one interacts intelligently with the refrigerator, I suppose. Um, um, you know, that's perhaps not a very good analogy, but I think there's a layer of AI literacy which is important, but often literally going on because it's so complex, not even the people um, who have developed this stuff quite understand what's going on. So they have to keep recalibrating and filtering or whatever. So, yeah. So, thank you for physical. So, another round of applause. Well, I believe that that uh, brings us to the end of the seminar. Thanks for coming and thanks for the support. And uh, also, I think Professor Cook will be here for a few more minutes. Yeah. So if you have any more type of questions or game about your, your research, feel free to uh, have a chat with them. So thanks, sir. thanks for your support and uh, participation. We'll see you all next time in the next seminar. Thank you. Sir.